You're tuning in to the Bueno Power Hour podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Bueno Power Hour podcast. I'm your host, Arthur Bueno, and I have another special guest here. Uh, I've been following him for quite a long time. Um, he is uh, what I've known first, the front, uh, front man of the band Dangers. Uh, he is also... Uh, an ongoing candidate for a PhD in uh, literature and creative writing. Uh, he is also an analog photographer and just all around cool dude. Al, <laughs> welcome to the episode, dude. How you doing, man? Hello, fine, sir. Hello, human beings who I will never be in person. Uh, <laughs> good, good to talk with you, my friend. Uh, it's been a few, been a few months since I saw you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I, I kind of talk to you here and there, and I know that you've been quite busy uh, for a while, um, kind of just getting shit done and such. Um, kind of wanted to sort of just talk about. I just want to kind of talk about some memory memory lanes here, um, kind of just how I found out about you. So, I actually found out about yeah, you. That, that, I found out about you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm interested in this. Really? Okay. Okay. So check yeah. check this out. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so there was this, um, this sort of, uh, I guess, uh, this company, I guess, in Fresno, California called Religious Appeal. And, yeah. uh, yeah, so, Ooh, uh, gross. <laughs> well, it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, ran by John Esquivel. I don't know if you remember him. And, uh, I'm even knowing. Yeah. Yeah. So he was one of the people I think had helped um, run uh, most of the shows at the CYC in Chinatown, Fresno, California, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, so you played a set there that was probably one of the most life changing sets I've ever experienced because Kamadri played, um, I believe, uh, Ghostlim played. And yep, then, I remember it. And then the last band was you guys. It was Dangers. And um, what what really captivated, uh, what really like kind of just struck me is that it was the energy of not only you, because you do really good like crowd work. Uh, the people, the people fucking just went ballistic. I'm just like I've never ever seen the house so explosive in my life, and so. This was something that I kind of was, it, it really took, you know, it really put me kind of in this space where, you know, and especially the things that you say uh, during these sets, um, some of the yeah. things, some of the things that you had uh, talked about uh, on certain interviews. Um, I remember uh, there was this uh, time you went to New Britain, Connecticut. This is where I'm currently like uh, residing in right now. And yeah, you, you played at this Polish. I think it was Polish Hall, like Pulaski Club or something like that. I'm not even sure. Yep. <laughs> yep, I remember that too. Right, right. I came in there with the Filipino jacket, and um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and and I was totally like, hey, I, I, are you from the Philippines? What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> And that's kind of where the relationship uh, sort of started with me and you uh, on that kind of regard, because uh, I remember I came to you and Anna, I I remember watching an interview that you were talking about. Uh, it's not verbatim, but you uh, were overhearing a, a teacher uh, who was basically just kind of just like so kind of just over it with like, you know, teaching kids. And I remember your response. This is not verbatim. This is your response was like, "Then why are you still doing this? You know, like why? Are you, it's, yep. it's not like you're, you know, if you just look at this at a job, then you're not a teacher. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that really struck with me. And I, I remembered that. Then, in following like maybe a year or two, you you came back uh, playing at um, Wallingford. The house. It was at yeah. a yeah. It was at some like 
fucking like VFW hall and I wore my jacket again, you, instantly you knew who yeah. I was. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you, know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, yeah, dude, this guy knows what's up. I wanted to ask you, are you, do you have like Filipino blood? Uh, no, but no comma. So, uh, my grandparents on my mother's side, my grandmother, uh, my maternal grandmother was born in Hong Kong, Okay. but moved to, she's not Chinese. She's, uh, Philippine, not Philippine. She's uh, Portuguese by blood, Mm -hmm. but moved to the Philippines when she was 12. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather grew up in the Philippines. He's Spanish by blood. Mm -hmm. Um, so both of them colonial and Mm -hmm. grew up in the Philippines, um, met there, uh, right around or just before world war ii broke out and had a crazy crazy experience and then i've grown up with this crazy war story where um in my estimation they were both very catholic and like they probably thought you know life is going to be very short for us let's get married Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they got married had and immediately had a a child and my grandfather was like 21 22 Mm -hmm. my grandmother was 19 20 um Japanese were uh, occupying. It was just very crazy times. My grandmother right. tells stories about like huddling through rice paddies to get diapers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, long story. Uh, because you know she was born in Hong Kong, she had papers, um, and her family had papers to that were English. So when they got liberated by the the Allied forces, um, they got on a boat, didn't know where it was going, and. Uh, my grandmother and her five sisters, my grandfather, none of his family who all stayed behind the Philippines. And then my grandmother's parents, they all ended up here in LA. And my grandfather told them all like, Hey, we don't have enough money to buy coats for everyone. We can't go for like the boat was going to Vancouver. So it was like, we can't wow. go to Vancouver. We're staying right here. Wow. Um, so yeah, I have, it's funny because I don't have any uh, Filipino blood, but there is Filipino parts of our family now because some of my grandmother's sisters married filipino people and just in general like we went to the philippines and played a few years ago and my culture is very mixed it's just like spanish culture but also there's filipino culture that's in there because that's where they grew up and right you know my my grandmother grew, raised us eating minchi and rice and no one knew what that was forever and, mm-hmm. and stafado which is like spanish version uh, i don't know so th- there's all different kind of uh, conglomerates. So whenever I see anybody who's Filipino or from the Philippines, I always, most of the one I would have met you too. Like I would have been in my brain because I hadn't been there yet. Um, And it was really, I'm always interested in Filipino culture. Um, You know, the Gabe brothers too, I talked to about uh, that stuff a lot too. So, wow. So, so that, that's kind of where I am kind of happy that I, I met you and you kind of sort of explained that because, um, you know, my girlfriend had, uh, has some history Her her parents has some history because, you know, the Vietnam war and, um, where my, um, my family is from, uh, well, at least part of it, uh, they're in this, uh, section, I think in the North of Philippines, uh, it's called, uh, Borong Pataan. It's, uh, I guess it's like the, sort of the site, the, the village near, uh, Alangopa city. And so mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're talking about the allied forces and such and such, and, you know, the military, um, you know, the Navy base was built there. Uh, and that's how my father was able to get a uh, citizenship, um, because she, wow. he, yeah, he enlisted in the, in, um, in the Navy. So the funny thing is, is that what probably could have happened is I, my parents could have met your grandparents and my parents could have met your girlfriend's parents because, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's weird because people were seeking refuge in such uh, an Island that, uh, you know, cause there's not a lot of, which unfortunately, I don't know if it's because of me, I haven't really looked it up, but they don't really advertise how important, and how crucial the Philippines was part of that war. You know what I mean? Oh, pivotal. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, well, they're also the shielding. They're the, they're the first major landmass, you know, that's between, uh, other than Australia, I suppose, but between, you know, the West and the East as you're going that way. And that's correct. Just, just knowing, I think one of the things for me, and I'm not, I'm sure for you as well, like growing up here, but having that be part of my story or my, my family's story, 
you know, I'm second generation on that side. Sure. And then on my dad's side, my, my dad is black from East Orange, New Jersey. So, uh, I have always felt like the true, like America to me growing up, it's not it was like white or black or like, it's just such a, a melting pot. And I think I was lucky enough to grow up in a family, like our family reunions or when we have like Christmas parties or stuff like that, it's like, you, you know, some of my grandmother's sisters married Mexican families. Some of yep. them married like white soldiers. Some of them married uh, Filipino people. And my mom married this black guy. Like, it's like we sit there and it's like the United Nations and no one blinks an eye or bats an eye at any of it. It's just like, that's our family. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's, it's, it's to me when I, I always get a little bit, um, uncomfortable, I don't get uncomfortable, but I feel less, uh, seamless i suppose like i remember spending some time in indiana i dated a girl who went to purdue for a while and i remember how segregated it was there and just the bodily confusion that i had which is like well why are ever is everyone living there and then everyone is living here and that's true in la where i live too i mean there's there's obviously segregation all over the place here but sure. within my immediate family uh it was not like that at all and i think to a certain extent it had something to do with like why i got into punk and hardcore just in that like i don't know like the outcasts or the things that don't quite fit right you know and i never felt like you know john john smith justin smith you know right, sitting in the right. back of the classroom necessarily right, right even though on the other flip side i was raised culturally very white you know like that's the culture that i grew up in right beach los angeles beach culture so mm -hmm. I, whenever i see other people at shows like that especially um, people of color, people like that are marginal and like not just, you know, you know, blue blooded American. I always kind of have like this mental feeling that like, oh, this probably is a more comfortable place for you to be as well, because it's where kind of the outcasts ended up going or the people that don't quite feel like they fit in other places. Um, and that's true about white people, too. I'm not trying to say that like white people sure, have sure. to feel like they fit in that door either. But but yeah. Um, I mean, especially in our band, we talk about this a lot where it's like we've got three minorities in the band and now two white guys in the band. And, uh, <laughs> that's not the case necessarily for most like of the music genre that we end up playing in or, or the bands we end up playing with. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's so strange because like talking to you about this kind of stuff, it sort of just puts me back in memory lane as to how I was raised because, you know, back in the 90s and and up into the 2000s, you know, at least in Filipino culture and Asian culture, you know, like you had to be a certain kind of thing, you know, in order for for you to be kind of categorized. And it was kind of weird because um, being, being part of like, you know, uh, being part of like emo and punk and stuff and sort of just – understanding like my identity uh that it doesn't belong to this you know these jocks that play sports or not to say that that's wrong or anything like that but uh not being part of like a crew of like you know asian folks that are just like hey man let's um you know let's go let's go spend like thousands and thousands of dollars on these hondas you know what i'm saying and like it's gonna break down in about two years you know you know what i'm saying like th these are kinds of things that i i had such an identity crisis growing up that i think when i when i found punk and when i found hardcore um it sort of just made me feel safe and it's kind of weird how like people at least from outside of this sort of universe when they see our shows uh, they kind of see like violence ensu ensuing, but it's just really just aggression kind of being taken out, and then you know people kind of like hugging it out afterwards. Yeah. It's just so strange, man, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> man, this is such a great start because you know I've been wanting to talk to you about um, artists of color for such a long time, and uh, especially for me, like even though by blood you know, you're not Filipino, I've always looked at you as Filipino for some reason. And it's just so weird is that, huh. yeah, like, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I mean? It may be because it's that Spanish blood. I mean, there is a lot of, you know, Spanish influence in the Philippines, you know, and, and you just have that heart. But, you know, we don't, you know, in, in Asian 
Asian culture, like punk and hardcore doesn't really exist with us here in America. You know what I mean? So it was yeah. kind of, you know what I'm saying? It's just kind of just weird. I, I look for it all the time. And probably the only band that I know is from like Bay Area that, you know, uh, Sean Leary and uh, the dudes from uh, L are going to be, I think you're going to be joining mm -hmm. them in um, in uh, uh, Canada, Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. We will be. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's funny that you say that because, uh, not funny, but um, I'm the kind of person, as I have globe trotted, that um, I fit in in a lot of cultures. Like, if I'm in Italy, people think I'm Italian. If I'm in uh, Spain, people think I'm Spanish. If, I, if I'm in Hawaii, I might be Hawaiian. Like, I can pass for a lot of different cultures. I remember going to Morocco. It's crazy. So I went there by myself and I was trying to figure out how I was in Fest trying to get to Marrakesh. No, Fest trying to get to Casablanca and I didn't know what train to take and I'm sitting there in the middle of the tracks looking and this super uh, white Australian guy comes up to me and is like, excuse me, uh, which train for Casablanca? And I was like, I don't know either. And he's like, whoa, <laughs> You're not Moroccan? What's going on? I was like, oh, what's up, man? What's up, Doug? And we like, end up hanging out for the rest of the trip. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that it's strange. Most people are surprised when I tell them I'm black. Like, that's yeah. the last thing yeah. that they'll expect to a certain extent. And, you know, when I'm with my dad's family, um, in the rare instances that I am, um, my dad lives in Austin and my uncle is in Atlanta. My other uncle lives in Philly. And most of that side of the family is kind of splintered and fractured but mm -hmm. i'm you know the whitest person on that side of the family <laughs> and then when i'm with my mom and that side of the family i'm the blackest person on that side of the family but like you know no one makes it it's been an issue a few times growing up for me and my family there's been a few moments when like teenage years when cousins or friends of cousins have like called me the n-word to like get a rise out of me and yeah whatever um but i do think that one thing that I noted, I'm not sure how this parallels with your life, but growing up when I got into, when I started getting into louder music, like my closest friends from elementary school and middle school and high school, when I look back at it, most of them were minorities. So I've got yeah. a lot of really close Turkish friends. Um, I just, and we all fell into punk and hardcore. Um, Swedish guy, uh, an Egyptian guy. Like mm -hmm. my first, my band in high school was me, an Egyptian uh, first generation Egyptian, first generation Turkish, uh, and then two white dudes. Um, wow. And like, it, we didn't ever talk about it because none of that wasn't. It, I, and I'm not sure. I never felt like I had a culture, to be honest. Like, I felt like my culture, and maybe it's why I identify and have stuck with and it's in, in me so much is, is like South Bay hardcore punk rock, like Black Flag and Descendants, where my formative years, like they were, you know, 10 years older than me or 15 mm -hmm. years older than me. I wasn't around when they were around, but when we started getting into music, like that's what, who we like, I remember listening to Milo goes to college and being like, shit, like that came from my high school. Right. This guy like knows exactly what it's like, you know, like mm -hmm. listening to like Catalina or, 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 um, you know, bike age and being like, ah, that's mm -hmm. about where I'm from. And it just felt like, I, I'm, I identify much more geographically than I do culturally. Um, that makes sense. And that's, I think, because I don't, I, I don't have, I have got a half brother and a half sister. They have a different dad, so we have different heritage. Mm -hmm. And I have no other siblings on my, my dad's side. So mm -hmm. I'm the only one in my family who's had whatever kind of cultural experience that I've had. And wow. that just leans me into going like, okay. I'm I'm where I'm I'm a product of where not what I guess if that makes some sense. That does that definitely make sense. I mean, it it really your surroundings have you know kind of and you know what's crazy is that like when I when I read the things that you 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 write and such, the, there's you're just so in the fucking zone. You know what I mean? It it's just sometimes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're just in the zone. It's just it's there's so much feeling to the shit that you write you know and i'm just like fuck man like like how do you think like that dude that's just fucking genius so that that's that <laughs> that kind of like brings me to this it, it brings me to these kinds of like 
questions because you know I like I've been living for this interview for for a little bit kind of just seeing how like how you know you're all made up you know uh creatively <laughs> and um obviously um from my understanding you started dangers like kind of in the early 2000s is that correct yeah so dangers uh rose out of the ashes of a different band that i was in called the miracle mile mm -hmm. um and that band arose out of the ashes of my band in high school uh which is called Miyagi, embarrassingly enough. But <laughs> um, it's funny, like the musical. And before that, I was in a band called um, Defiance. And that mm -hmm. was my first band when I was in over eighth grade, ninth grade. And then right before that, I was in a band called Independent Jays, J A Z E, and we covered Aneurysm by Nirvana. That's all we played. <laughs> So I can like do my whole like history going back, but what's funny is that each band that I was in, like there's one or two songs that the band before like didn't quite get to that I had written, and I was like, well, I have these songs left over. I should do a different band, and we'll do these songs. Sure, so like, sure. um, there's bands that, like, you know, the high school band had a song called Adios Amigos that like became a song for Miracle Mile. Miracle Mile um, was. I went to school on the East Coast, so I'm from LA, but um, I'm from South Bay, I'm from Manhattan mm -hmm. Beach. But I went to the East Coast and started a band with two young kids who are still here in the South Bay because I knew they knew how to play drums and play guitar, and they were like mm -hmm. younger kids that were cool. And then my best friend, who I met at uh, at college at Princeton, um, we would write songs there, and then come back here and tour a bunch. That was Miracle Mile. Wow! And that lasted for about two or three years um and i used to put on this big festival it used to be a festival in philadelphia or near philly in wilkes Bear, uh called uh posi numbers and mm. we we got to play it one time and it was like a bunch of bands from all over played um i remember like i saw modern life is war and suicide file and i was like dude why don't we have this on the west coast this is crazy so i got a grant to do that on the uh from school to do like a concert on the west coast so i put a this Sync with Cali Fest was done here in LA um, in Redondo Beach and Miracle Mile played that and it was kind of like great and then what happened was we all hated each other after two tours and <laughs> um, the last Sync with Cali was coming up and I was like well uh, it was my senior year of college and I was like I have these three songs left over I don't know what to do with them so I was back here for winter break and um, asked the drummer from my high school band. I was like, Hey, can you just learn a couple songs and just go record a demo with me? And he's like, sure. So we went and recorded the demo and it was me playing everything except for drums. And then had no band. And I went back to school and Tim, uh, dangerous first uh, bass player. Mm -hmm. He had played bass in miracle mile. And I was like, Hey, listen to this. I didn't tell him it was me. I was just like, Oh, what do you think of this band? And he came down after he was like, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> I was like, do what? And he's like, oh, I'll do the band. And we didn't even have a name. Like, I didn't know what the band was called or anything. Um, and so that started in 2000 and that was 2004 to 2005. Mm -hmm. So like December 2004. And then we started actually like thinking about what we were going to do in 2005. And <clears throat> it was hard. What was difficult back then was that like it was just me and Tim. And we didn't have a guitar player. And then Roly, who recorded the demo, um, ended up saying like, oh, I'll, I'll play drums. And then we needed to find a guitar player. And then mm -hmm. we went through a bunch of lineup changes to, to start because like the band started basically out of like, here's four or five songs that I had. Does anyone want to play them with me? And then eventually what was kind of tough was I was still living on the East Coast. So mm -hmm. I was living in New York for, for graduate school as well. I went to Columbia for uh, an MFA. And that's how Danger started. It was like every break I had, winter break, summer break, spring break no vacation, no travel would come back and just, okay, we're touring for five days. We're touring for eight days. We're touring for nine, nine days. We're going to do a summer three week tour with Comadre. And, um, it seems like not that long ago, but now that I recognize that was 15 freaking years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's really overwhelming sometimes because my life has stayed more or less constant and just kind of evolved, but the band has always been there. Um, and that sort of uh, outlet for me. And 
I think that that kind of like will clue you in as well, which is like, it was always an outlet. It was never meant to be. Um, I mean, I guess part of this is an excuse, but I, I never saw it being the thing. It's just, uh, it's too ugly of music. Like it's not accessible by mass appeal. And so yeah. I never saw it paying my bills, but it was always the thing that let me feel alive again. And, you know, if I went more than two or three months without playing a show, it just like totally frustrated me. So um, to this day, that's what it is. It's it's the constant like creative outlet for all of the people that are in the band. And I'm lucky that it has gone on this long and I've run into people who are now like part of the fabric of the band. Like, you know, like Anthony is the band. Chris mm-hmm. is the band now. Justin has been the guitar player for 10 years now. So it's mm-hmm. like Jack has, you know, been around since the very beginning of the band touring with us or like, you know, helping us record or doing all the stuff. So the, the people who are in the band now, they are the fabric of the band. And, and I'm glad that it has been released for them as well. And it is so weird. There's, there's your history of dangers. Right, you know. right. <laughs> And and that's what's cool about it is because like you never you never thought of it as being a full time thing. It's always been sort of just like, hey guys, um, let's go kind of like come together and work on this project and you know do the best we can yeah. to sort of you know write something out and record a record. It, it never sounded forced. That's probably what I love about the project. It's it's always been a product of of you know of of care if that makes any sense, you know what I'm saying? I think that, well, I think for like, Justin and I have like this constant, like butting of heads about this sometimes. Like if you look at the sheer volume that Justin Smith has put out in his life, dude has written so many killer songs and riffs and like, it's like overwhelming sometimes to think about how many graph, like songs he's written and, and, uh, ghost on songs and he's in like five bands and then he's always writing songs and I'm like, Jesus, how do you keep writing this many songs, dude? It's ridiculous. I'm like the opposite of that, which is I like that your your word, which is considered or careful or Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Not forced. I mean that's the nice way of putting it. But I think one of the other sides of it is that um if you know like the the, the cadence of the band or, or or like when it it's almost like a bad, we're like a bad case of herpes. It's like, <laughs> don't hear anything from us for a while. And then all of a sudden it flares the fuck up and you're like, whoa, fuck. And then it kind of <laughs> disappears for a while. And that was by design, to be honest. Tim and I, when we started the band in 2005, we were like, look, what, who are our favorite bands and why and how are they our favorite bands? And, you know, back then I was, you know, there's, I mean, he loves this band from New Jersey called Degenerates. Um, they're not around anymore. I, uh, Dos Oath back then was really big for us. Mm-hmm. Um, bands like, uh, Suicide File were huge. Mm-hmm. Um, American Nightmare and of course, yes. Bane back then was a huge band for me. And I like got, but when you look at it, it was like these bands that didn't play 75 shows a year. It was like, they're doing a winter tour. That's it. I have to be there. I have to see that show. If I'm not, I don't know when else I'm going to see them again. Right. That urgency is to me, vital to the music, right? If you right. know, like, oh, I missed the show, but they'll probably play in two months, and, like, it'll be at a bigger Henry Fonda theater. Like, I don't know, man. Like, that, to me, never... It, it's cool. It's different, though. Like, for me, I want the urgency of it. So we've kind of talked about it back then, where, like, Tim and I were very much like, look, we want to do things with our life that aren't just music. The music needs to be a reflection of how we feel about the world. And maybe the cadence of the band and, like, the, the rhythm of it is that it takes me a couple of years to process my life, the world, and to get it onto paper and into to, to a guitar so that it can reflect like what like right now what we're writing and what I'm thinking about. It's like the second Trump came into office, it's like, yeah, I want to put out a record tomorrow that's just like what the fuck is wrong with people. All right. But if we did that, if I did that, it would come out like a uh, a, a pouting child and I'm not interested in putting out something that sounds like a pouting child. Right. I want to put out something that really reflects how I truly feel like the nuance of it and my frustration with the world and my confusion with the world and all of that 
takes me longer than a lot of other people to process on, on, apparently because there's people writing amazing music right now that's just like bam it's out there's people writing songs about coronavirus right now I'm like how the fuck do you guys write a song about coronavirus <laughs> it happened two days ago <laughs> for me the process is a very slow um almost like you know how like the, the tide will like you know wash away at the sand wash away at the sand and then all of a sudden there's like oh look at that beautiful seashell like that's what it takes for me like i'm I'm sitting here in the room right now. I've got my guitar and amp to set up, and I have to go over and over and over the stuff. And it, it really grates on most people, including people in our band. Mm-hmm. And I see it as a beautiful thing. You know, I love going over and over and over things until I feel like, yeah, that's actually that's how I feel. Like I've now found the real, either musical language or or lyrics that really fit how I feel. Um, and it's rare. Like I, even the songs that we have, like there's only a handful that I am, that I don't think like, yeah, I don't know if that's, is that really how it felt or not? Like I, at the time, like, yeah, that's it. And then you revise later, but like, you know, like wonder years is still exactly mm-hmm. how I felt right, at that right. time. And I'm like, Ben, Ben in the break is still exactly how I felt when that right. happened. And that's what I'm after for every song is like, capture the, the feeling the mood the moment exactly and people i'm a perfectionist so people are just like dude just fucking finish the song let's go next song you know <laughs> right 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 i don't know well let me kind of just sort of validate that because most of your music most of the band's music is very pregnant it's always fresh and um i kind of i kind of look at that as like uh your liter- your literature and your photography it's just so it's so carefully um what's the word that i'm looking for um rock right <laughs> it just doesn't it W-R-O-U-G. ages it's it's just so it ages so well and like looking at like listen to some of the the you know the back catalog of dangers and such um you know what i find is that there's groove there's rhythm there's aggression there's you know yeah obviously that for most people it's not going to be very accessible but for the people that understand it i mean you got people putting tattoos of your guys shit on their skin you know what i mean so there's you know it, it's just kind of it's kind of crazy because okay you yeah you can easily like throw out like covid19 bullshit but that's just like bullshit you know that's kind of what I've seen a lot of bands do, where like they'll 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 make a batch of music and just release it, and it's just, it's like it's like rap. Like most rap stuff sucks. It fucking <laughs> sucks. Like 20, 20 to thirty tracks of just you know sp- space and just nothingness, <laughs> and it just doesn't make any sense. There's no concept, you know. So. The word I was looking for is curated. It's carefully curated, and yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how I sort of like listen in and what you what you say, how the the guitars are arranged, and how they're, you know, everything is sort of just conceptual and everything kind of just bleeds in so well, and which kind of like well, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. I think that no, yeah, I think that like if you the analogy that I think of sometimes is. You know, like, if you get a suit, you know, off the rack, it's going to look all right. You're going to look good. You're going to be fine. Sure. You're like, oh, that guy looks good and winning. But it's not going to – you're going to feel the little – like, it won't really won't look that different, but it won't feel that – you'll notice it as you sit down, like, oh, man, it's too tight in the arms. I think it's, like, too short here. Yeah. You know, and you're, you're hyper-conscious of it. Whereas if you get a, a suit and then you go get it tailored for like, you know, another $20, you can walk around, it looks good, and you feel like, man, this isn't going to split when I bend over. This isn't going <laughs> to, like, and I don't really do that. I don't really tailor my suits, to be honest, and I should. But, like, uh, <laughs> even a cheap suit that you buy, if you get it tailored, all of a sudden it just, like, it looks so much better or right. feels so much better right, when you wear it. Right, and right. that's kind of, like, my, to me, what happens with a lot of music today, especially because things have gone digital, and I don't have a big, like, like Jack is a very huge proponent of analog recording. And I am too, but I'm not like, it was recorded digital, I can't listen to it. And he's not that way either. But 
I do think that the the problem with digital music is the ease, and this is the same with photography, but the ease with which you can erase and redo some of the things means you lose the urgency, uh, you lose um, the technical skill, I suppose, like yeah. it's not as important, and you lose uh, the, the consideration like you're talking about. Because as a band generally what happens is like i'll bring an idea to the rest of the guys we'll work on it a little bit and then come back a couple weeks later and they'll be like man i don't like that or actually that one part's good let's like take that part which is what we're doing now let's take that part and like make a whole different song out of that part and that process is painstaking (laughs) so that when you see any band and, and and maybe this is true about every band i hope it is but there's certain bands that you can go and watch and go I don't know, that that kind of just seems like a toss-off. Like, there's one riff, and, like, that's it. It's just a riff. It's sure. not a song, it's a riff. Yeah. Versus other bands where, like, you know, it's like, man, for that minute and 30 seconds of music, it probably took them, like, 16 hours. Sure. Just to figure out exactly what they, you know, and that, like, most people, that ratio is not worth it, especially yeah. in punk, yeah. where, and rap, too, but where where style is far more important than the substance, and... You know, I think our band has uh, not necessarily... We've suffered in terms of, like, the amount of fans that we could have because, like, a lot of times we just nitpick over stuff, or I nitpick, not we, over stuff that doesn't really matter, and we could have put out a bunch more stuff and maybe, you know, on on bigger or better labels or something. But, like, I don't know. I am... I tend to... I appreciate the compliment because we do... That said, I still think that we're a very flawed band. There's a lot of stuff that I'm like, man, that song could be better. This could be better. But that's just like every person who makes art feels yeah. that way. I think I, I am I am wedded to that process. It happens in my own work privately. Like when I write something, I will write as far as I can, as many sentences as I can get down. Then I have to go to the top, reread the whole thing, then write one or two more sentences. Go back to the top, reread the whole thing, write two more sentences. So. By the time I'm on page 27, 28, I'm reading 26 pages just to add two sentences. And people think that that's absolutely nuts, but I don't have a better way. That's what that's how it feels right to me. Right. So, the process. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who gives a shit about having big labels and more fans? I mean, it's more to the aspect of like the people who actually had created a relationship with your guys' work. You know what I mean? I mean, like, I don't. I don't really give a fuck about like big labeled bands as much as I maybe should, but it never, it never occurred to me. You know what I mean? It never occurred to me that I, cause I, I write, you know, I've been trying to get this, you know, EP, uh, that's mixed in with, you know, the photographs that I took, uh, this one year. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Cause you, you talk about like concept and you talk about like how to, you know, sort of keep, um, keep sort of an idea uh of of work fresh and sort of stay fresh you know for that time uh i used to be married i actually got a divorce in uh 2017 and um and so to sort of reflect on that feeling i decided in 2018 that i was gonna uh do a project uh i was i was trying to do a full-length record with just what I had, you know, and, uh, use Instax images to, uh, sort of like challenge myself in making black and white images with just using this like shitty, uh, Lomography Instax, you know, camera and sort of Mm -hmm. try to try to coincide that with, you know, the music I was writing and it failed miserably, but it, (laughs) you know what I mean? It (laughs) fail better, right? Fail better. Yeah. And so like, but I just said, you know what, maybe I can just, you know, f- figure a way to sort of like take a different turn and make this just more of like take out, you know, cut off the fat and like put in the real meat in there. Um, so I understand where you're coming well, from with that. And I think it's also important to note, and this is true. I mean, a lot of, you know, art classes will talk about this, but you can see things as a failure because they don't come to fruition. Yeah. But those are necessary steps to get to hopefully the art that eventually does come together. Right. Right, Like 
all of you, for every symphony that you hear, for every, you know, or silver jazz song, for every Miles Davis solo, there's probably 84 that you don't hear, right? <laughs> and, and that's important. It's important because a lot of times when you're making art, and this happens to me too, what you're doing is you're seeing the far side of anywhere from, you know, half a year to 10 to 15 years. Like my photo book took 10 years to make, you know? Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's flawed as well, but like, you know, it's, what, what people, what you can consume in sometimes a song, right? Two minutes, uh, a movie, two hours, what you can consume in that amount of time has taken so long to produce, which includes all of the movies that you're not seeing, all of the outtakes that are like, oh, we try to make a movie about, you know, uh, we try to make a movie about bears in Alaska and it ended up, we made a, a zombie movie in the apocalypse. And it's like, <laughs> what? Like, how does that happen? And I think it's important sometimes as people who are creators, I, I always lean away from calling myself an artist, but like pe- people who like to make things, what we're doing all the time is judging ourselves, hopefully uh, not too harshly, but against things that have been created without seeing the process. Mm-hmm. And so when we're going through the process, what we're going is like, man, and this happens to me daily where I'm like, man, I bet that person like didn't struggle like this. Right. But you don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know how right. many books that, you know, that, that, um, Donald Bartholomew, one of them said, right. I don't know many how many pieces of paper he threw away. Right. No, I don't know. Lydia Davis, how, how often she erases things or, or just thrown a whole computer's worth of work away or something, you know? So it's important, I think, as people to create to recognize that the mistakes and the failures are only such if they don't get you to a better place. Right, right. You know, if they, if they, if they don't help you get to a, a new, different, more interesting place, then yeah, okay, maybe it was a failure. But just because it isn't something that goes public or that people see... I don't know who fucking cares about that. It, it, it matters <laughs> that it, it gets you to a different place. Yeah. You know? it, it definitely, I definitely appreciate you saying that, man. And which kind of like sort of wants me to ask you this question. How did you end up getting into photography? Because this is what's so interesting about your body of work as a writer and as a, a you know, a front man of a band uh, I only got, and I've, I've yet to like purchase the book, hopefully sometime this week. Your images are so quiet. And, <laughs> in, and I don't know, I don't know if you, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of like, you know, uh, I, I, I get inspired by a lot of, you know, creatives who, uh, creative photographers that are out there that just take simple analog pictures. Um, there's this one, uh, woman, uh, two women uh, that I follow currently, uh, Nika Aquino, who she's you know Filipina, who just takes these snapshots of her her life and and sort of just documents what's been going on. Uh, you'll see like images of like uh, her father's like funeral in like oh. a, a shitty a shitty point and shoot camera with like Fuji, you know, superior film. Um, uh-huh. and along with Courtney Coles, I don't know if you know who Courtney Coles is, but, um, she's yeah. this, uh, artist that, um, this black female artist who just photographs just like her daily life of point and shoot camera, just quiet images. And I look at your work too. And I'm like, man, like it may kind of make me feel like, is this sort of the life that I've kind of led to? Because that's I kind of want to capture that same sort of moments all the time. Like obviously, like mm-hmm. how you compose, it's there's so much energy going on to it, but it's just so like it's so <laughs> calm. You know what I mean? It's so calm. You know. Um, I appreciate quiet's a good description of my work. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> and you're using um, this is where we kind of get geeky because uh, what kind of camera are you using right now, dude? Um, so I use a Mamiya 6. Everything is Mamiya 6. Damn. Uh, which I got, I mean, your other question kind of parlays into that. So I, when I was at Princeton, I was a, an English major, um, working on a creative thesis 
and all of the creative arts at Princeton are uh, in one building, which is kind of why I decided to go there after I, I got it. I, I wasn't like, I wasn't like, oh man, I'm going to go to Princeton one day. I just <laughs> kind of applied because my father suggested right. that I apply. My family's from New Jersey, and I was like, all right, I don't think I'm getting in, but okay, public school kid, let's see what happens. And um, but they mm-hmm. have at the time it was called 185 Nassau. It, it has since moved to a different building, but um, it was an old school, an old elementary school, primary school, and like drama, um, photography, painting, um, every uh, writing, poetry, like everything was in the same building. So you would inevitably rub shoulders with people, and it was just a very um, fertile kind of area and I had one I had two electives that I didn't know what I was going to do with in my junior and senior year and I was like you know I kind of like photographs like I don't know let's see <laughs> and uh, I went and took a course from this woman named Jocelyn Lee whose work you might enjoy as well but um, she is um, amongst my two or three favorite teachers professors that I've ever had in my life and right what was really, really exciting to me when I walked into class, she, she interviewed everybody before, like, to, you know, why do you want to take this course, da, 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 da. And what was really exciting to me was she went, okay, so you're a writer. I want you to understand that, like, I'm a writer too, you know, like that I'm writing with a camera and that's what oh. we do. Like, we're, we're not taking pictures, we're making photographs. And Ooh. it's one of the things that I really, really love about her is that, she reminded me that everything is a story and everything is, has, if you can look at things a certain, with a certain perspective, it doesn't matter how simple or how flashy or exciting. It's your own perspective that has to be the art. Like you are telling the story for other people who are not looking at it from where you're looking at it from, whether it be literature or whether it be photography. So, um, Studying with Jocelyn, uh, I studied with her for a whole year. Um, I took two courses, like an independent study with her too. And it just became very clear that photography was part of my life. And mm-hmm. um, I worked with uh, a Canon AE1 for all of those years. And then I went directly into an MFA at Columbia in fiction. And when I was there, it was the same thing. There, The arts building there, School of the Arts, is photography, cinema, uh, theater, writing, like all of the different arts are in one building. And there as well, one of their mandates is you have to take courses outside of your um, concentration. So I had to take, I think, three or four courses outside of writing. Right. And I was like, well, not a hard decision for me. I'm taking photography. And crazy is that I studied there with Tom Roma, who was uh, Jocelyn's teacher earlier <laughs> in, in life. So it was like it's kind of full circle. And, um, what happened was I was still using my Canon. Uh, I was dating at the time a girl who lived in San Francisco and I had gone out there. This was like the very beginning of my time. It was 2005 in New York. I flew out to San Francisco to hang out with her for a week for right before school started or something. And I remember I was on BART coming back from the city to go stay with Tim. I think we, the band had played some shows up there possibly too, maybe Gilman or something. And right. I got off to the BART and at the Ashby station and like turned around. I was like, Oh shit, I got my camera. And I looked and the doors closed and I watched my, my Canon A one just like <sighs> sitting on the seat, like disappeared, like, hello, goodbye. And so I got back to New York and I went, you know, I don't drink. I don't do any drugs. I save so much money from the city. I don't go out. I'm going to buy the camera of my dreams. And I just spent like $1,300 of money. Oh, I didn't really shit. spend it. Uh, on my Canon, or sorry, on my uh, Mamiya, and it has never left my side. It's my. What's amazing about that camera, by the way, if you're into photography, is that it is n- a little bit heavier, but not very much heavier than a regular um, uh, 35 millimeter camera of any size. Sure, yeah. And it functions much like that. Um, it's a rangefinder camera, and right. it is. It's you know you can take it up from the hip and. You know, dial up your app stop. You should know. I've learned how to use it in like I don't know three days. And when I'm, I, I do a lot of photography when I'm on tour or when I'm traveling um, and around home too. But it's not a not a uh, elaborate 
uh, process to like get a, a picture up and like take it. The other thing I was going to say to you, which is interesting when you ask, because a lot of people do digital nowadays and, you know, at some point I might just get so expensive doing analog mm-hmm. stuff. But one of the things that I love about it, if you think about the process that we were talking about before, is that it's very much like how I like to do things, which is I take a picture in like April and I wait to get things developed for about three to six months. I just leave the canisters there in my drawer. Yep. They're in the dark. Yep. And then I'll take, you know, 15 to 20 rolls down and save up some money and get them all developed and scanned craftily. And I'm surprised again. I'm like, oh, but that time, that distance from when the actual photograph occurred allows me to edit my work way better than if I had a digital camera, took it and was like, oh, that's a good picture. Let me get it. Right, oh, man, right. I got to put that out right away. Right. You know, because um, you're too close to it. You have to put things in the proper perspective. And um, yeah, that's why that book, I mean, that book is literally 10 years of work. And I didn't, I, I always want, I wanted to put it out before that, but I just didn't have money to put it out. And yeah. um, it only came about because a close friend of mine, I was in Yosemite uh, camping with a close friend that I've known since I was very young. Um, and we actually went to a lot of schools together randomly, but you know, we were talking and he goes, he was watching me take a photograph. Um, I was taking a photograph of half dome, but, uh, it's called, it's one of my triptychs. Like I have mm-hmm. three or four different modes of working and I like to flatten the plane of the world and, and put the F stop at 22. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I really like to, to make things kind of graphic that are, and things that are very familiar like that. So like if you, you go look at the picture in there, it's of Half Dome, but really it's just three planes. It's, you know, sky, rock, trees. And that's the three elements that I want to break the world down into rather than like, oh, look how beautiful Half Dome is. So he's sitting there <laughs> watching me take this picture and he goes, hey, when was your book coming out? I was like, I don't ever think it's coming out. I have money. We started walking. He goes, well, I'm just going to pay for it then. And I was like, no, you're not going to pay for it, Billy. He goes, <laughs> No, yeah, how much does it cost? I was like, honestly, it's going to cost like 10 grand or, you know, nine to 10 grand because I want to do it the right way. He's like, okay, let's do it. And I was like, I said no at first. And uh, he's a lawyer, so he makes a decent amount of money. But I was like, no. And then I went, actually, yeah, let's do that. And I will sign a contract that I will pay you back within three years. And so we did. Wow. It's the only reason that book came out, and 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 you know I'm working on the second one now, but it's gonna it take a little while. Well, that's that's fine. I mean, like I'm kind of surprised that um, you're shooting everything at f22 because I you would I would think that on because um, your your Mamiya six has the op- most open apertures f3.5, right? Yeah, I don't do everything at that. I, okay. I do, so there, if you go back through the book, you'll see. Look for there's certain pictures that I call triptychs, which is there's just three horizontal planes. Those are all taken at 22. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm endlessly convinced that windows tell us more. Like a portrait of someone's window, you will learn so much about a person from like what they have on the window so and what's there. So right, right. I have a whole ongoing series of windows that I try to frame correctly and then then there's the other stuff which ends up being more like you know there's portraits of people um which are rare and then moments i call them you know like there's certain moments and what what i really am doing to be honest with photography and it's not dissimilar from the book i'm trying to write right now is finding the connective tissue between the elements of my life and if you watch like if you go through that book like homeless is like all about the sequence of it and adam from grass helped me lay it out and you know we took a good i drove out to arizona two times to lay the book out with him um digitally and look at like how it would really feel and it's not about every image linking directly to the next but as i go through life i remember like oh man that image it's still in my head like you know the covered bridge when i was in georgia yeah. Reminds me so much. I'm here now in, you know, uh, in, in uh, Auschwitz. It's like somehow these things connect to me. 
And I love art that does that. And it's, and it, to me, what it really is about is taking the world that's so huge and crazy and unfathomable and overwhelming. And what you're trying to do through, for me, what I think I want to do with art is to take the, the, the world and its gangliness and its, and its disorder and create some sort of pattern so that it becomes mm. doable. Right. Mm-hmm. I want it. I want our, our brains are constantly looking for patterns. And for me, the chronology of it doesn't matter whether it's 2008 and I'm in, you know, Tacoma or it's 2013 and I'm in Osaka. Time and place are far less important than, you know, and why it's called homeless. It's like home is a feeling. It's a it's a, a mo It's a, a mood. And and the idea is that you can find that at any given time and place. And if you're looking for it and that's what, what to me, what photography is about, it's about finding that same mood over and over again. And it, there's photographers that I love that do the same thing. Um, Joel Sternfeld is probably my favorite photographer. Mm-hmm. Um, Greg Crutzen is really, really great. Larry Sultan. Um, Larry Sultan. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm saying all men right now. I want to say like women, uh, Carrie Mae Weems. Um, <laughs> um obviously Arbus is just I'm looking up at my shelf on my crew I have over here. Um but these are people that I don't know that like you know it's not there's a different way of doing things. Stephen Shore is another person I love, but like um you can look at someone like Glenny Friedman who is a great photographer. Right. But it's ninety percent the content and 10% how he's framing the content yeah, yeah, versus yeah. someone like, like Robert Frank or Walker Evans or uh, Lee Freelander, like their content is quiet. Yeah. So quiet. Like here's a rapper on the ground. Right. But right. somehow the way that that person is looking at it creates. So it, it you can it, it exalt something as stupid as like a rapper to some sort of like icon to some sort of idol, to some sort of uh, bigger meaning. Yeah. Right. That, like, right. that rapper meant nothing to the person who threw it away. But if you look at it the right way, it is ev- everything just in one moment. And, and that's what I try to do with photography. And I have this theory that I teach my, my kids when I'm, when I'm, when I'm teaching, it's called like the volume of verbs, but it works with photography too, which is, how many times in your life do you really go through and experience murder, rape, um, uh, you know, violence to that level? Hopefully very rarely. Right. right. And yet the majority of art is about like murder and, and these volume 10 words um, versus the art that I really love that like calls to me, speaks to me is the work that's like, Oh, this is a volume two verb you know it's like holding hands you know or like yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah um glancing out the window right whereas those things if you can find a way to make really high art out of those moments to me it is such an achievement because that's really what we experience through life your day-to-day is full of like ate cereal looked at phone Mm -hmm. talked mom you know right, like right. these really like mundane things and and yet those can be art too and there's certain certain people that have shown that to me that um just they make me feel less alone and they make me feel like i'm not wandering a fucking terribly terrible <laughs> world all the time you know it's so funny <laughs> it's so funny how you're saying like the uh, volume verb verb volume and like you know murder rape Whereas you're looking for, uh, you know, bodies of work that um, is very soft to the touch. And I think that's kind of what I've like loved about this, you know, the preview of this book that I I'm anticipating and getting hopefully this week, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of, um, of kind of like a movie, like you're very cinematic on the way, how you approach your, your, your framing and stuff. Uh, I don't know if you mm. see that in kind of like how, because I went to art school like for years and sort of just try to dive into like, you know, when you're talking about Larry Sultan and Robert Frank, you know, I was more of like uh, Gary Winogrand to Joel Meyerowitz. Oh, yeah. 
Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, Diane Arbus was I just, uh, was kind of weird for me, but I, I liked it. What were you going to say, though? I just didn't look to the – I've got a winning grand over here, too. I just didn't look all the way to the left. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these are – I actually mean, caught that winning grand photograph of um, um, Central Park where it's that couple, the white – woman black man and the chimpanzee that they're holding yeah i taught that photograph in my i'm teaching a course right now on emotions and literature but i used it as sort of an example of that versus there's a really great um walker evans photograph of uh, a trolley or a bus back in eh, it's probably the mid 50s um maybe even earlier than that and Looking at that photo, or no, it's a Robert Franklin guy. Sorry, it's not mm-hmm. uh, Walker. Uh, where there's like you know racism that's you know blacks in the back of the bus, and just talking about like like you said, those are moments. I was actually driving around today, and you know all these fast food places are saying like drive through open or like open for to go or something like that, and I was like, God, this is such a moment in time that it feels normal now, but as soon as I take a picture of it it's going to be so surreal given if you do it in the right circumstances. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, Where it's just not just a, like do- said, a yeah. small little documentation, like just a piece of paper of like, this is what this is. And this is what happened. Like this is right. Right. An impact. Right. Um, the quiet, the quiet. And you know, what's crazy about that is like, I'm in some crazy loud band, but if you look at the content of like what the songs are about, there's a lot of quiet in like what we're writing about sometimes too. And it, it's a little bit more nuanced. I think it's why it doesn't resonate with bazillions of people, but it does resonate very, very intensely with uh, the people who like our band, like our band a lot. There's yeah. not a lot of people who like our band, but those that do like our band like it a lot. And I think it's because we're all in that same sort of wavelength of like, it doesn't have to be about like, you know, there's some songs that are like, fuck God. Yeah. Whereas, like, our song was like, "Where are Goliath's bones?" Like, <laughs> what? That's a weird thing to think about, right? It's like <laughs> just left of like the loud exclamation point. We're more of like a. There, there's a lot of bands that are exclamation points, and I really think like we're more of like a dash, okay, you know, or an ellipse. Yeah. But, like, huh? Think about that. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> well i i love i love like what what's so interesting about you is that you have many contrasts you know what i'm saying and i think that what i loved uh and what i really look up to as far as because uh, you're you are like one of the role models that we need here in our in our nation and who you know adapts a good diet who's very healthy um, physically and mentally as much as he can because, you know, like all of us have sort of like issues that we always try to try to go to, but you always try to approach it in such a healthier way. And, you know, it, it's almost as if punk rock kids who grew up to become adults, the ones who I follow <laughs> have always come out on top and have tried to serve community. And, um, I think why I'm so invested in like knowing what you do and what you have to say is because I'm one of the people that believe in what you say, you know what I'm saying? And what you do. Um, I don't know if a lot of people say that to you very often and I'm sure they do in, in some cases, uh, even even your buddy Justin, even like Jack, like you know, like yeah. I'm in I'm invested in their guitar playing and the way how they sort of approach uh, DIY ethics, you know. And you guys are like a product of, you know, what youth should really still keep um, keep at. Uh, I don't know, man. I mean, like knowing like kind of your background what you've what i've experienced from you from jump and what i've started to learn from you over the years um it, you are not that much of a complex person that maybe people may think you just <laughs> you know what true. i'm saying you know you know like i think it's just people just take they look at you in a different way 
because your persona on stage is so different from what you represent in you know life and conversations like these yeah. i could easily just take you out and get like you know a vegan burger with some french fries or maybe like a good <laughs> like you know what i'm saying a good cup of tea or coffee yeah. and we'll just talk about nothing and that's kind of where yeah. you, you know what i'm saying that's kind of where i see you become like if we were in new york you were still going to school and we were roommates we would probably be eating a vegan burger with some french fries at the stoop and probably just people watch you know what i'm saying that's probably that's kind of how i've i've yeah. known you you know what i'm saying um dude. well it's funny because you not funny but you you just so you know we were supposed to start the interview at seven and i was like late because uh you know i own this gym now i co-own it with an old friend of mine from i know him since we were I, he was six and i was eight and this whole virus is making us have to do a whole different way of like doing the gym and we have to right. do internet stuff. So we're just having a little bit, try to figure that out. But I was doing the workout of the day. I have to get it done. And my roommate, uh, who, you know, he hasn't done a lot of the workouts with me. He's decided like, all right, we're in this fucking thing. Let's do the workouts together. And he's, he's athletic. He runs a volleyball club. So, mm -hmm. and we had, you called when I was just starting the third round <laughs> I was an hour into the workout and I was like, shit, I gotta do this thing, but I have to finish this last round or else it's going to eat away at my like brain for the rest of the night. And what, I mean, I just had to carry a, I didn't have to, I modified the workout to be slightly more difficult than what we had for the rest of the clientele. Mm -hmm. Um, because I have 185 pound sandbag just sitting in my garage now. And right. so I was like, okay, for my cardio, I'm taking this sandbag and I'm walking it to the top of my hill, which is, you know, it's a good 350 yard round trip, which is a lot for 185 pounds to carry and mm -hmm. up a fucking hill. And it's funny that you like how you're saying that because like, I, I appreciate the, the, the idea of the influence, but at the same time, like, you know, I was walking down with that bag. I had took a pause at this alleyway and my neighbor starts driving out these uh, Daniel and Elena and, they look over at me and they're like, Hey, and there are two people that go to the gym. And I was like, Hey guys. And they don't know. They've never been to any show that I've ever played. I think they probably have heard or seen some of the bands because people will like check it out once they find out I'm in a band at the place. Mm -hmm. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, just bring the 185 pounder back home. They're like, Oh wow. That's really tough. And I was like, yep. And then I looked at, da I looked at Daniel. I was like, if you want, there's a couple more at the gym. If you want to bring them back to the place, I was like, yeah, I might do that. I was like, all right, have a good night, guys. And I think they're going out to get food at the grocery store, come back, or whatever. And, <laughs> you know, like, it, it, the the thing is, like, if I'm at a show, um, if I'm teaching, you know, I've got to do a Zoom class tomorrow for my kids at USC. If I'm coaching soccer, which I coach, a lot of people, like you said, there's a lot of contrast in my life, perceive as, like, disparate elements. And to me, it is all of a part. It's all about communicating. It's all about how do I communicate either with my body, with music, with photography, with writing, uh, as a coach, how do I communicate in a way that not necessarily like, yeah, I want people to be better. You know, there's a little bit of PMA in there. Like, yeah, I want everyone to like strive to be a better person or whatever. Mm -hmm. But really, really what it is to me is like, this world can be incredibly terrible. Like I've gone through some stuff that's like, you know, it's not like anything that other people haven't, you know, heartbreak, some death. Um, that is really like, you know, family stuff, you know, uh, divorce, whatever, like mm -hmm. all this stuff that people go through. And I look at it and I go, man, there are times when I give in and I'm, de I mean, I'm generally a depressed person. I know I don't seem that way to most people. I'm very happy to lucky and I'm on the surface. The people who have dated me, the people who are my mother, uh, my sister, no, there's moments that like I'm a I'm a few clicks away from like well I'm walking off into the middle of the desert or you guys are never gonna see me again like I don't fucking need this shit right and right right it's because like I am so invested in the world and I care so much that when the world lets me down like you know if I'm looking at a bunch of people congregating when we all right now know like that's not what we're supposed to do it doesn't just go like well fuck those guys I go like why am I, why human beings? Why the fuck do I have to share the species with these people? And it's a very negative thought. Yeah. So I think really what I try to do all the time through all of my work is 
if, you know, for this Daniel guy, like, I'm like, hey, you should go get this sandbag. Part of it is I want him to, like, challenge himself and get better and for his own life. The other part of it is I'm like, you know, it will be a more interesting world if Daniel, like, in the aggregate, if Daniel tries to carry 185 pounds up this hill. You know, he doesn't have to do that. And it's mm-hmm. cool that he'll benefit from it. But in general, the world becomes a place that I want to live in more if someone's doing that. Right. You right. know, and I want to, to – I think that one of the, the, the mottos that I live by, whether it's artistically um, or as an instructor, this goes back to what you – remember when we were talking about that, that – I think it was a guy who was like, yeah, I'm just not that into teaching. And it just totally was like, right. what the fuck are you doing there? Right, right, right. It's because it's – it's really about to me, like y- the world is endlessly interesting and fascinating, and there's so much to do in it. People all the time in this music that we play that you know that you know your first introduction with me, but this is true about literature as well, and it's true about photography, anything. You find these things that like fit you really well, like people who have a passion. It's like oh. Exercise too, like people who like are diehard into CrossFit or diehard into Spartan races or whatever they might be, they have found something that feels like a home for them. And yet in all the other aspects of their life, like who they're going to vote for, what food they put in their body, who they're going to fuck, uh, what what the movies they're going to watch, they check the fuck out on those things. And right. they only have the capacity for the most part to be like this one thing is my passion and it's going to fit me well. And all the other stuff is like, yeah, whatever, crew socks tube socks i don't really give a shit i I don't understand i don't understand that you have the opportunity like if you're coming to see a danger show you have done some fucking research to figure out because we don't even advertise shows that often so you really got to give a shit and you have taken so much time and care to about what goes in your ears do the same thing with like what your day-to-day job is do the same thing with what you're fucking eating and that's not necessarily because i want that for you but it's because i think in the end what that does is it allows me it's almost selfish it's like well then i get to live in a world that to me is a better place i think that everybody and this is super condescending and arrogant or assholeish but i do believe it i think you have to earn the air that you breathe and most people including myself a lot of the time do not earn the air that you breathe but i'm trying you know i i have to leave at the end of this if i do everything correctly hopefully it will be an aggregate of like you know i took this many resources out of the world I, I breathe this much oxygen. I put this much trash onto the planet. Uh, I use this much carbon, but I also offset that with this much good, you know? And mm-hmm. I, I don't think most people are interested in that equation. Most people are interested in like, how do I have fun? How do I enjoy life? How do I be happy? And I, I, I just, that's an easy question. You know, get, <laughs> get a blow job every day and you're happy. Like that's happiness or right. like, you know, go, go fucking uh, do whatever drug makes you feel good every day. Like that's yeah. happening. That's so easy to do. It's like so to me, easy. it's more about how do you balance the scales so that at the end of your life, you can die and go, well, I earned, I earned my life. You know, I didn't, I didn't squander the hours that I had here. And I want to be around more people like that. So I think that I try to, the only like as I've gone, I'm 37 in a couple of weeks, and I think that I've at least accepted the mantle of being a teacher or a role model or a mentor because I know that I am. Right. And right. My hope isn't that people end up like me. My hope is that people end up trying to balance that equation in their own sort of way. Yeah. Because you know what, honestly, who who would want to be like ourselves? <laughs> it's frustrating <laughs> I'd be miserable you'd be a miserable person if you're like me my friend <laughs> man i'll tell you this it's so funny like you're just like echoing everything that i feel because the fact that like i think most people in this earth do not like deserve to breathe is i mean it's kind of accurate <laughs> you know what i'm saying so i'm not i'm not it's, it's- it, it sounds terrible, and it isn't true necessarily. They don't deserve it. That's maybe too harsh, but it's that they're not interested. There, there's a simple empathy that is wholly lacking from whole swaths of our our fellow peers, and empathy is important because it allows you to live a better life, not yeah. because you're allowing other people to yeah. live a better life, too. It's like, I can't go see the, the Great Barrier Reef anymore because everybody wanted to eat burgers and fucking use oil all day long, myself included, you know, like 
And it just seems to me, I was there, I was at Trader Joe's today and I was, I was contemplating like, what did I want to get? I wanted to get like cookies because they're delicious and oh, we're at absolutely. home right now. Everyone's a little depressed. And I thought to myself, I mean, this is genu- genuinely how I live my moments. Nah. Like that's all I thought. I was like, there's more harm than good in right. the cookies. I right. don't, I don't need the cookies. I'm going to go home and do this ridiculous workout. And like, that's the choice of like, like it doesn't seem that way, but like it connects into the same idea. It's, you know, I want to, it's not about always doing the thing that's harder, but it is about doing the thing that like nine times out of 10, I like to lean into the thing that like, yeah, I know that's probably the right choice. And most people yeah. know what the right, that's the yeah. thing. Most people know what the right choice is yeah, in life. Yeah. It's just, it's not fun or it's easier to do the other choice. And so eh, someone else will make up for the shit that I'm doing right now. And it's either going to end up really cool because we're going to live through a crazy catastrophe and I'm going to get to see it. And I'm like, well, you guys fucked the world up. At least I get a front row or I can take my part and like die knowing like, well, I, I, I tried to make it slightly better, slightly more interesting. That's so funny how you say that. I remember Ian Ian Mackay said something like, in regards to um, like be, being as a vegetarian, right? He goes, "The only reason why people eat meat because it, it's out of convenience," and like this is yeah. kind of you know what I'm saying. And it's kind of just how um, I mean, it's kind of just sort of echoing like kind of like the cookies like sort of like explanation that you had you know what i mean it's not like you're necessarily yeah. like you're making life harder for yourself it's just that you're just you know it, it's like a poster that i read and it, the poster said life is tough it's tougher when you're stupid and <laughs> you know what i mean and and it, it, that's resonated with yeah. me so hard and um you know i work i work at a I work at a um, at a company right now who is helping process uh, Medicaid uh, insurance. So right now, like a- as of this recording, guys, you know, COVID nineteen is is hitting pretty hard in our nation, and yeah. we just uh, recently just opened up uh, open enrollment for these folks who are unemployed and are not insured. But you know, I look around and like you know uh i'm i'm hearing people like talk about how like they're going to get like you know canned fucking garbage or how much toilet paper they weren't they weren't able to get because some asshole decided to get it you know and you know for you and i like i look at these people as this like yeah, these are the people that shouldn't be breathing. And I know that sounds kind of harsh, yeah, as well. But, like, it's all entitlement, man. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I just, I fucking hate it. No. But, I mean, but that that's the thing is that, like, you've always been communi- uh, communicative and communicative with your people. And I've always appreciated that about you, man. Like, just kind of how, you know you've always taken the time to let your fans kind of like communicate with you and you were able to ask questions if they needed, you know, answers, you know what I'm saying? So, but I think that's important because I mean, I do that with my students too. And and there's uh, the greatest teachers are the ones that realize that they're constantly a student. Yeah. I'm a proponent of that holy, holy. And, just because like someone admires our band or music or any work that I've done, like that doesn't make me any better or more important or more special than they are. And I relish every opportunity to learn. And so if someone wants to come up and talk and, you know, the common thing between us is something I've made. Okay. That's a great starting point. But in the end, what I'd like to take away from it is that I get to grow a little bit too from it. And, and to be honest, I don't know, maybe this kind of sums up the, the idea or the feeling. It's like a lot of people will tell us, tell me in particular, because I think, you know, they're like, oh, you're the singer. Um, but like, I've heard many times, like, your band, like, saved my life, or 
can't tell you how much your band means to me. And my response is always generally the same, which is, no, I know how much our band means to you because it's done that for me. Like, right. it's not a one person entity. I've got four or five other people that have, you know, they know me. They can't stand being around me when we're not playing because they know so intimately how crazy I am. You right. know? And I think it's, I think what, what I, what I want people to understand is that the art is a conduit, you know, Mm -hmm. we're all going to be gone. And I think what's important is that the art creates the the possibility of empathy. It creates the possibility of connection. And one of the magical things is that if it's recorded or, or published, you can create that connection over time. The (laughs) people who are, are dead are still communicating and connecting with me yeah. and they're allowing my life. I remember when I read Herman Hesse, I read Siddhartha when I was 15 and it validated my choices. You know, I decided I didn't want to drink. I would found minor threat and I decided that, you know, I was kind of going to do my own thing. It was a little bit more radical. And I read Siddhartha and I went, Whoa, this guy understands me. Right. You know, like, yeah, it's the life of Buddha, but like, it's more, Herman Hesse understands who I and he was born, you know, and then I read Nude Hampson and that was written a hundred years before I was even born. And, and so there's a way in which art and creation, yes, it's important because it's entertaining, I suppose. And because it allows us to pass the time, but more than anything, and, and I hammer this home with our students, it's, it's, creating the opportunity for connection and the, and the ability for us to empathize with one another. And it's a really sad thing being a teacher in the world right now and looking at how much everything is going science and math, which is great, but all the humanities are being cut and the humanities, Justin and I talk about this a lot. He's a, he's a history professor. These are the ways that we are able to engage with one another and, and be productive about, entering other people's perspectives and, and understanding that we are not alone and that there are other human beings that are impacted by our choices and our ideas and our feelings. And without that, we become automatons, we become, we become robots and just service sector fulfilling orders bullshit. And what I really want in anything that I do, man, this conversation with you, uh, the workouts that I do every day with our clients, I tell people all the time, it's not a gym. This is a place for you to come and like do something you've not done before to, to, to commune with other people to be like, man, we just went through that. You know, it's almost like sex with people. Sometimes it's like, man, we just did this physical thing. It was ridiculous. Right. And you get to communicate with someone in a way that you don't normally get to. And I, I guess that's the, the, I'm still perfecting how to do that in, in literature and writing. <laughs> I'm still perfecting how to do that in, in, art but hopefully i get better at it you know i i it makes life which i don't think is often i often don't think it's worth being around for a lot of the time to be honest but i'm in a moment right now where i'm recognizing kind of what you said i appreciate the compliments but it's more like just exciting to talk and recognize that um we are able to connect you know you and i you can grow up where i grew up i didn't grow up where you grew up you didn't date the same people I dated. You don't know, you know, you never met my mom. Right. But there's something and art was able to bring us to, to a place of understanding with one another. And, you know, you can go to bed and I go to bed knowing, well, there's another person who gets it. Yeah. You know, there's another person who feels like I do. Mm-hmm. And that's, seems very quiet again of a thought of a feeling, but it's so powerful. You know, it can sustain <laughs> you through moments of, of great, great despair right 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 and also you're a very sexy guy too so <laughs> you know once in a while i get a haircut that's true <laughs> well al man i wanted to say thank you very much for um you know speaking with me uh tonight this evening was probably one of my like best evenings i've had in such a while because you know i've been wanting to talk to you for such a long time man and um I can't thank you enough for giving me this opportunity to kind of just uh, talk shop about, you know, sort of your processes and how you how you went through a lot of shit to kind of create all this 
beautiful work. Um, is there anything that you wanted to promote before we go? Oh, promotions. Uh, I don't know. There's going to be one more Dangerous record. We're not sure when it's coming out, but we're working on it. So that's okay. important for people to know. Um, and uh, what else is there going to be? So there's going to be another Dangerous record um, sometime in the next two years. You should be able to find a book with my name on it out in the world called Concrete Flag. Mm. Um, so look for that. And um, I don't know if there's anything else to promote. Uh, I'm a, I, I run a gym called Gate 14. So if you live in the L.A. area and or you're an investor that like wants to invest in something that's really fucking cool, uh, go to gate14.net. Um yeah, the band's pretty cool. Oh, and I guess uh, I, I always talk about uh, cultural materials. It's the imprint that I started to put the book out. But um, if you just, you know, it's going to be like a, a a slow growing, like a train going two miles an hour is what I hope. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one release every couple of years. But the stuff I want to put out on there is going to be pretty interesting stuff. So look at culturalmaterials.com. And if you have anything that you want to put out, uh, you or other people, I always love people sending me ideas like, hey, I want to write this book or I want this book of photography to come out or I want this event to occur. I was, you know, as, as long as I can facilitate it, I'd love to do it. So culturalmaterials.com. That's my life. Alfred, I really it, appreciate it, man. I really, really, really appreciate it. It's been such a nice like night to kind of talk to you about it. And yeah, I'm probably going to hit you up with that, dude, for sure. Um, do it. Dude, thanks again, man. And um, I'm gonna be texting you more often, dude. If you don't mind, we'll we'll talk more shop. And when I visit LA, uh, I'm gonna hit you up and we'll go eat. And I'll take you out for for some dinner and shit. You cool with that? Always around, my friend. It's so <laughs> good to talk to you. All right, I'll see you later, man. Be good. Lates. <laughs> and that includes this episode of the Bueno Power Hour podcast. I want to say thank you to Al for um, giving me his time and, um, you know, really sharing uh, sort of his experiences as a creative. Um, I know that he doesn't really like being called or label himself as an artist, but, you know, <laughs> the things that he does are pretty damn artistic, I got to tell you. <laughs> um yeah, uh, I I think that now it's starting to become a little bit more clear as to how I approach things um, as an artist and, you know, to being able to have something printed or something out there for people to still have some sort of validation, whether if it's through melodies or literature or singing or whatnot, any kind of communication I can give these people in the afterlife and be able to have that sort of resonate with someone like yeah you know maybe that's something that I kind of want to consider more often than not and that my work has some sort of purpose but you know that's that's what I want you know I want people to kind of recognize that I'm trying to speak to them and hopefully validate their feelings you know with what I do um and so yeah guys I really appreciate you for tuning in um if you like this uh, episode, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you want more episodes like this, uh, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And as always, thank you for tuning in to the Bueno Power Hour podcast. Peace, guys. <laughs> Love you all.